Now, what gets people into this state? And by the way, I have this picture of the prisoner up here because if any of you have watched this BBC series, if you haven't, you should, because it's about this poor man who gets trapped in the village. And the village turns out to be, it's, it's basically a government program to drive him crazy. And I guess get like government secrets out of him or something. And every day he wakes up and he's still in the village. They try to gaslight him by making him feel like he's the ones that crazy, that's crazy because he feels like it's not real, but he can never get out. And it's just this horrible, horrifying drama of him like trying to fathom what he's in and how he can possibly get out of it and keep his mind like uh, from going crazy. This kind of is the way our culture wars feel to me. That's why I say it's like a hamster wheel. It just, and I can tell you there's no difference between this iteration and the 20 other ones that I have experienced that get people out in arms that go, you know, to the school board and go out and protest. But what is a little different is that there's just a growing, growing incivility, like an inability to, um, to be polite at all, to sort of like recognize the context that you're in. And that means that there are people who are seriously obsessed to the point where nothing else, nothing else in their surroundings, nothing else, including their family, their human, this is dividing families and breaking them apart. Literally nothing else matters other than this one political issue. And that is a type of craziness, okay? I, I wrote a book about that. There's a picture of it on another slide in case you wanna get it. It's called Ideological Possession. Um, and it really is a type of craziness. It's an obsessiveness. It's a narrowing of focus. It's a sort of losing hold of your human relationship. Okay. So like I have a theory about what's going on here and I hope, I hope you will indulge me a little bit. Um, and Brian, please do tell me if you get any questions along the way. Okay. Um, but we are now in post-industrial liberalism during the industrial period there was more of a collective sense, okay? It was kind of like the last gasp of collective action, whether it was unions or even a little bit later in the 50s and 60s, the civil rights movement, the women's movement, people were able to act in an adult, mature fashion to try to achieve collectively certain collective goals. But as that era faded, and we became more of a consumer society and a service in, um, economy. Um, the natural tendencies within liberal ideology towards individualism, towards a sort of radical individualism came to the fore. We now live in a world where the, the individual is often isolated in a little bubble doesn't have a whole lot of human relations, spends most of their time online living through um, the mediation of social media or television or video games or some other way other than dealing face to face with human beings. The economy thrives on that. The consumer economy thrives on that. That's what it wants is for people to be isolated and have to be dependent upon products and mediating services that they have to pay for one way or the other um, in order to like have any sort of life at all. So the homo economicus distortion has become extreme and people see themselves as um, their worth is tied up in whether they can access and use the material things uh, of this world. Their, their identity is more tied up with that than with human relationships, which are fading. Um, our negative freedom is emphasized. The idea that we have a freedom from imposition of anybody else's opinions, needs, sensibilities. We don't have to address them. It's about me and you know, my rights uh, for, for not to be trampled upon or impinged by anybody else. And this is also isolating and it creates an extreme alienation in the process of, of ever increasing economic inequality that, that increases that alienation, as well as just the alienation that comes from, from forgetting how to deal with other human beings, okay? 
and how to have actual relationships with them. This creates a spiritual void, okay? And we're living in a world where religion is less and less of any real importance in people's lives because in its most meaningful sense, religion has to be collective. It's not just an individual experience and it's not just about individual salvation. It is a human thing and a social thing. And so it's fading away in people's minds. It's becoming just as utilitarian as the consumption of their happy meal, if they do it. Um, and this leaves a spiritual void. Well, in, in a certain theory, psychological theory, I guess that I study, um, that spiritual void doesn't just go away. It has to be filled by somebody, by something or somebody, okay? Um, you know, you hear people say, I feel empty. I feel empty, even though they may have a lot of things, right? When people feel empty, it's a recognition that there always needs to be something greater than yourself to fill that void. And what happens is because they don't have access to those collective identities, okay, um, that used to be the case more, okay, and because they don't have access to the religious identity in a meaningful social sense, they turn to these other identity sources, right? Largely political in nature. And the reason why is partly because that's what's on offer. It's easy to sell. It helps divide people. Um, there are plenty of people out there that want to sell that um, and get people to buy into it. So the identity then comes, identity battles come in to mask economic and spiritual deficits, okay? Yeah. In an environment where people are trying to make money on gigs like that, um, they are going to, they, that, that's going to create a lot of economic stress and a sense of alienation and lack of worth. Okay. Um, and if you can't have your economic issues resolved, which we can't meaningfully in this current system, then they shift over to, well, at least I can demand respect on the level of identity. Okay. And not to say that this doesn't like yield some good results, but I think it's good to also keep it into perspective, okay, as to what's happening when we emphasize this. Identity comes in all kinds of shapes and sizes. Um, and we generally would think that identity combat is safer because it usually has to do with ideas, like people who are into guns, they're like, I'm into guns and I'll post a lot of gun pictures on Facebook and I'll like go to gun rallies and I'll listen to Tucker Carlson and, you know, like I'm a patriot and it becomes like this, this sort of mental way of life. And usually it's just what, what we call performative as in this, this, it stays in the realm of ideas and social expression. We slap a flag on our truck and drive down the middle of the street with a Trump flag. And we feel like we're doing something like striking a blow for us as like, this is me this is me, recognize me, um, respect me. It's a call for respect and belonging, even if it is rather like distorted. But what we don't realize among other things, one of the problems with this is it stokes uh, basically a market, okay? There's a market selling things to these people. Um, they thrive off of their anger and their frustration and alienation and confusion. Um, and there's a huge uh, content market to feed them information. Everybody's making money off these folks, okay? Um, and not to single them out, right? Like I'm not, I'm not wanting to do that. This is a, this is an entire social phenomenon. It is easy because it's easier to say what you're against than what you're for. If you think that you have struck a blow for a better world by simply kind of expressing your dis disapproval. Um, you get the thrill of righteousness for doing so, but it is not necessarily effective. Now that guy in the middle there who just, you know, one more status liked, one more problem solved is kind of a little bit of a character, but also a little bit of a reality too, right? Like change your Instagram picture and you've, you've, you've made a statement. Um, no, you know, the, these are people over here are Extinction Rebellion folks. At first I got excited about them, but then the more that I saw the kind of protests they did and the effect that it had, I had to change my mind. 
because the easiest way to protest this economy, if you really believe that it's polluting the planet unacceptably, is to stop buying it. Boycott. And if they have the ability to get out in the streets and do this, they probably have the ability to hold a one or two day mass boycott of all services. And believe me, that would scare people. Um, so I know I'm being a little harsh, but I'm trying to make a point that we have been caught up in a particular kind of expression that has led to a great deviation, a great deviation in our energies away from doing what we could do productively, okay? Um, Catholic worker movements don't do this. Catholic worker movements, actually, the people involved in that do things, okay? They go, they go and do things on a daily basis that are very difficult. They're out there in the so-called trenches. Um, they're not putting on a t-shirt and expressing themselves. I mean, this type of protest is commodified to the extreme. And um, down here is a collection of green products that help people feel as though they are saving the planet. But actually the only way to help save the planet is just to stop buying most of this stuff, literally. Like, and even more so, your individual actions can't probably save the planet anyway. <laughs> so collective action is necessary, not just, just buying certain things. So when we get to this point, the cultural war is commodified as a ritual drama that kind of helps suck the psychological energies back into a safe place. It functions as a sort of materialistic faith so that uh, people don't get challenged by actual faith, okay? Which would probably make them question quite a bit of, of what they do in life. Um, it diverts and drains away energy and commitment that can be used to just roll up one sleeve and try to figure out what to do um, to, to really remedy poverty um, and to change the, the economic order. And I've noticed that it provides a fix. It's kind of an addiction. People need to do it over and over again um, because it's, again, it's a confirmation of identity. It is a weak identity, you know, the idea that my political expression is my identity. So then I have to state it over and over again, which is why I think I'm encountering people who can't stop talking um, about this one thing right now, the, the, uh, the critical race theory in this case. It's, you know, the need to immediately upon seeing you with no context and no setup to have to like harangue you with their political views is a sort of desperate cry for recognition. That's the way I see it. It's like you have lost, you have lost a great deal of dignity in the process and have to kind of like bombard with um, this demand for attention and recognition. So it's, it's a type of action or inaction that is entirely compatible with capitalism. It in no way interferes with capitalism. In fact, capitalism thrives upon it, loves division, as long as it doesn't break out into violence. And even then, as long as the violence isn't too prolonged, it's not that big of a deal. So sometimes it does erupt into physical space. And we see this in actions like Charlottesville, you know, or the Trump riot in, um, in Washington, D.C. on January 6th, or the Antifa protesters and activists that come out often to counteract these people, um, and even Occupy, which was a fairly big deal, but ultimately failed because it, it was well, well recorded that they simply just didn't know what to do next, okay? And in fact, in all of these cases, these people don't know what to do next because they never did really think about it because that's not what it's about. Ultimately, psychologically, it's about their identity and their self-expression and their anger and their need to kind of like spill it out and, and you know, communicate it to the world so that they can be understood and accepted and recognized. It's really not about planning um, for a future. So the eruptions into physical space, you've noticed, don't last forever and ultimately don't lead to very much effect. 
And the fact that they don't needs to lead people to ask whether those are worthwhile or whether they need to rethink their strategies.